Center for Faith and Life, I want to welcome you to this evening with uh, Matthew Sleep as we talk together about caring for creation and your soul. This event is sponsored, co-sponsored by our church and by Western North Carolina Green Congregations, and we're grateful to have the chance to have this event and this conversation here tonight. Uh, just a couple of details that you might need to know about um, and will want to know about. There's a resource table in the back and as you go out and as you came in, and those materials are available for suggested donations, and you'll see a, a donation basket there on the table and some wonderful resources that you can take advantage of. Uh, I want to tell you, you see the, uh, the flyer on some of your tables at least, that our next uh, event for the Center for Faith and Life will be our sponsoring, along with Mars Hill University, uh, the visit of Rachel Hell Evans to the area, and on Tuesday night, November 5th, she'll be doing a, a conversation here in this room uh, with folks who, who gather. And I hope you can come. But many of you know Rachel's work. She wrote uh, the wonderful memoir, Evolving in Monkey Town, and more recently, A uh, Year of Biblical Women, Womanhood. And she's a delightful person, and we look forward to having her here. Uh, I want to introduce Anna Jane Joyner. Anna, where are you? Where'd you get to? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Anna is the campaign coordinator with the Western North Carolina Alliance, and along with Richard Fireman is the co-coordinator of Western North Carolina Green Congregations. And after Dr. Sleep makes his presentation, Anna will have two <coughs> remarks to make, and then we'll be part of the, the panel that we'll have together. So we're so privileged tonight to have with us Dr. Matthew Sleep. You know about his biography. He is a, a a former emergency room doctor and the author of a couple of really fine books, Serve God and Save the Planet, and 24-6. We're delighted that you're here to talk with us tonight. Thank you. Welcome. Jewish, and they had four children. They had 
us a son and three daughters. And when their 18-year-old daughter came home and walked in and I saw her, their worst nightmare began to unfold. <laughs> Nancy, put your hand up. That's, that's my wife in the back. <laughs> and uh, so we, we uh, decided to get married, and neither of our families were very happy about it. They were pretty distinctly unhappy about it. And uh, they told her she was throwing her life away on a bomb. Which really wasn't that big a stretch. <laughs> and uh, so we got married, and uh, if you can't be born Jewish and you're married into a Jewish family, uh, the next best thing to do is go to medical school. <laughs> so, <laughs> Nancy uh, said that she would support me. And uh, no, no school would take me. And uh, an uncle of mine who uh, started the uh, four-year medical school at West Virginia University and started the American Academy of Family Practice and a bunch of other stuff said, I can get you into undergraduate school. You have a semester and the rest is up to you. And that was my big break besides me and my wife. And uh, I uh, worked really hard, was very motivated then, and I got into medical school two and a half years after starting undergraduate school. Not WBU, my uncle died in that time. And I went to uh, actually George Washington University. And uh, so my wife and I have two children, and all this time we have no religious beliefs uh, whatsoever. <laughs> Which is not to say that my son and daughter didn't celebrate holidays. They celebrated every holiday. <laughs> oh, how lucky they were. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's called double dipping in government. But so we, uh, we raised these children and we lived on the coast of Maine, and no one around us had a religious affiliation, none um, whatsoever. And so that was our goal. And actually, there were many, there were probably a dozen people, couples that we knew that were like us, that were from two different faith traditions that had married. And uh, our goal in life and our theology was to get ahead, to live a, a, a nice life and a comfortable life. And uh, I did well in emergency medicine. I eventually became director of the department and everything. And, uh, Life for us changed the turning point uh, when we went on vacation in the winter time in February, and we went. We stayed on an island in the Gulf of Mexico, and that island has uh, no street lights, and it has no causeway to it or anything, and uh, it has no cars on it. So it was really beautiful and quiet and everything. And during the daytime. When we arrived there, I wanted my kids to get worn out so that they would go to sleep early. <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> so, we did everything we could to wear them out. And dinner time came, and then bedtime came, and they were wired. <laughs> we stick them in the bed and they pop out and everything. And there's this great deal of frustration that I was beginning to experience because I wanted to go to bed early. <laughs> so, finally, I gave them diamond tap. <laughs> and they went to sleep, and uh, <clears throat> don't repeat this at home. Um, and, and so they went to sleep, and Nancy and I were sitting out on this balcony, and uh, we were staring out at the ocean. There was no moon out that night, so the Milky Way was just absolutely visible above us. And this breeze was blowing and rattling the palm trees. There's no more beautiful sound than palm trees being rattled by a breeze at nighttime in the tropics. And uh, in that perfect setting, Nancy turned to me and she said, what do you think the biggest problem in the world is? <laughs> and uh, 
I thought for a moment, and I said that the world is dying. And I said that uh, because of just changes I've seen in my life. And uh, I remember uh, some, the, my, a street where the elm trees were being all cut down as a kid. So there aren't elms on Elm Street. I remember being led into uh, a grove of chestnut trees that were coming down with a forest ranger on a field trip in elementary school. And the ranger saying, these are extinct, you'll not extinct, you'll never see them again the rest of your life. And so there aren't chestnuts on Chestnut Street. And there aren't caribou and caribou Maine. They went extinct when I was about junior high. And um, there, you know, I could go on and on. If, uh, if the blue pike, the most numerous uh, fish to ever be taken out of the Great Lakes because they thought they were inexhaustible and they were great eating, uh, they went extinct in 1978 or declared extinct then. And with all these changes, uh, I like to tell people that um, I haven't met anybody who thinks that we can keep up business as usual and it's going to turn out okay in 100 years. Um, I felt that the world was dying. And uh, so I said that to Nancy, and there was a kind of quiet, and then Nancy asked me what I was going to do about it. And I had no answer. And. Um, and she grew the evening for me, so I gave her diamond tap. <laughs> <laughs> I came back to work, and uh, a number of things happened in our lives uh, that were bad things. And uh, Nancy's only brother drowned in front of my children. He was 31, they were younger, but kind of a great weight settled even on my children, having seen that. And uh, I had a patient that stalked me, and I had seen him a number of times over the years. He overdosed on a number of occasions, and I resuscitated him. And uh, he did something one day that really scared me. He followed me to the hospital where I was working an hour away from where I normally did. He left a note there. So I, I told some folks, and the police checked on him, and his mother was in the closet. He killed her two weeks before. <clears throat> and uh, other stuff happened that I don't even talk about in public. And, and also this weight of a world dying and being asked what I would do about it uh, set on me. And my worldview was a uh, secular humanist. My worldview was that all we needed was the right engineering, the right government, uh, good thinking and planning, and it would be OK. But what I really confronted in life was evil. And my worldview had no way to deal with evil no way to grasp it or, or make sense of it or anything. And I started looking outside of my worldview. I read through a couple of sacred texts to begin with. The first was the Ramayana. It's a Hindu sacred text. And it's, uh, I, I read through that. It's, it's a beautiful story. For whatever reason, it's stuck in my head. And I can talk for hours about the story of that. I read the Bhagavad Gita next. It didn't stick in my head as much. I tried to make it through the Quran and uh, lots of other things. And there are truths in those books. But for me, I didn't find the truth. Uh, and I was at work on a Sunday, and uh, uh, it was slow. And I walked into a patient waiting room. I didn't have anything to read. And there was a coffee table there and a string of people magazines and old national geographics, you know, that sort of thing. And there was an orange book there. And I picked it up, and I remember looking at it and thinking, you know, this is the Bible. A, I've never read one of these before. And B, we don't have one at home. And we have a, a library in our house. Um, we're voracious readers. And, and um, but I thought, you know, we don't have one of these 
at home, and I wanted to read it, so I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> I read it through that Bible, and I was confronted with Christ. And uh, Christ doesn't leave you many choices. As C.S. Lewis says, he's either what he says he is, or he's a very, very bad man. He's not a good teacher. And uh, you, you, you get three choices, as Lewis said. <clears throat> Christ is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. And for me, it rang true that he was the Lord. And uh, in reading through that book, I found what I believe was the answer to the problem of the world that's dying. Uh, Christ asks us to not judge others, and he says if we do, that will be used against us. And he says that we're always trying to get the, a speck of sawdust out of somebody else's eye. Meanwhile, we have a two-by-four in our own. And that's a carpentry joke. And I was a carpenter, and I recognized the carpenter speaking when I, when I read one. And it says that we're supposed to clean up our, our own act first. So the long and the short of it, I'll give you the short of it. Uh, was that eventually I, I said to Nancy that if we needed to change our lifestyle, at least for us, we had to, to downshift how much resources we were using and that sort of thing. And, um, and I told her that, that I also wanted to quit my job and follow the Lord, and that we need to sell the house and give away a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Do you know what she said to me? She said, are you sure we need to do that much? <laughs> and um, we did, eventually. I'm editing this for editorial purposes. It took a little longer than just that. But eventually, we lived in a house that was exactly the same size as our garage. And we cut our electric bill to a tenth of national average, and so forth and so on. Do you think that's a big deal? Have you ever seen a doctor's garage? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we, uh, we changed our lifestyle radically. But the biggest change that was that first my son and then my wife and my daughter all became followers of Christ. And eventually we got baptized in that very cold water. <clears throat> and, um, the, uh, uh, should I do the tree thing or not? So not no, forget the trees. <laughs> it's exactly. All right. I have been given just this enormous access to the church over the last seven years or so. And I was, I was, think, I was told, um, I asked David Jane, well, who's here tonight? She says, well, there's Baptists here, but there's Episcopalians and there's Catholics and there's Presbyterian. And um, we probably got lots of other folks represented. And I've been able to preach at the National Cathedral as a guest preacher once a month for a year, and just went to U.S. Council Catholic Council Catholic bishops in D.C. to talk to them about the Sabbath and everything, and um, uh, get to work here in the state with your seminaries, including uh, Southeastern and everything. So we, we get to operate in this very wide bandwidth. And people will ask me, well, what, what, what do Christians think about the environment and that sort of thing? And what should we do first? And after you pray, um, I, I tell people now that the first thing they ought to do is keep the Sabbath. And uh, why do I tell them that? Well, that's the second part of the story. Is that okay? Okay, we've got the phones up from the business. All right. How many of you here, by the way, keep the Sabbath? Ooh, we're working against the numbers here. Okay. To a degree, I hear. Okay. Um, this is a this is a, a promise. By the way, when you're brand new to Christianity and you're in your mid forties, you got a lot of questions. Uh, because people in churches tend to speak in Biblish. And, uh, and, it's, and you know, how do you relate the Old Testament to the New Testament and everything? 
This is what I'll tell you, this is the long and the short of it, if you were new to this like I was, is God never breaks his promises. He may give you a better deal, and that's what comes along, but he never breaks his promise. And this is a promise out of the book of Isaiah. This, by the way, is written out of, it's out of a message by a friend of ours, Eugene Peterson, who was one of the first people in the church to kind of really support us in, with prayers and finances and everything. If you watch your step on the Sabbath and you don't use my holy day for personal advantage, if you treat the Sabbath as a day of joy, God's holy day as a celebration, if you honor it by refusing business as usual, making money, running here and there, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Promise. Oh, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. I'll make you feast on the inheritance of your ancestors, Jacob. Yes, God says it so. All right, that should set the tone. How many of you are going to keep Sabbath now? <laughs> What's happened to the Sabbath? When I was a kid, it was just the cultural norm that everything screeched to a halt on Sunday. But uh, it's gone missing. We live in this world where we can order a car at 3 in the morning. You can go to, to uh, school any hour of the day. You can have a 3 minute day in 30 seconds. I mean, that's the kind of world we live in. And the Sabbath has gone missing. And it's this giant cultural thing. And I learned about the principle of uh, missing things in medicine. <clears throat> This is a chest x-ray, and uh, it's a replica of one that I saw. And the thing about this chest x-ray, it's like all x-rays, you're looking for something there that isn't supposed to be there. You find a tumor or a bullet or an infection or whatever, you see something that's there that's not supposed to be there. This x-ray is an example of the kind that slides by doctors. And I remember two patients sliding by me even after I'd learned this lesson and took a number of people until they saw what was wrong. Because on this chest x-ray, there is nothing there that's not supposed to be there. But the left clavicle is missing, often a sign of cancer. And, uh, and so the Sabbath is one of those things. It's really important, just like this, but it's really hard to see something that isn't there. Culturally, we're just attuned to seeing new things. It's all about the new, not the missing. This is the fourth commandment. This is what, this is the real estate in time that the church has been parked on for thousands of years. The church is not a building. The church is the people, and it's this piece of time that's its home base. And uh, this, this commandment says that not only are we supposed to stop and rest, but our Maid servants, our man servants, our uh, meeting people, minimum wage workers, foreigners in your land, be here illegal aliens, or people who don't share the same faith as you, kids that can't even read yet, we're supposed to teach it to them, even the animals. And so here we see that this ethic is extended beyond us uh, to even the creatures that we work and live with. <clears throat> Oops. <laughs> But we go all the time, right? I want, can I take the, just, okay. I want you to do me a favor. Everybody, take three minutes is all you get. And at your table, you discuss with people your favorite memories of Sunday. Now, if you had a grandma who sent you and made you do something terrible, then leave the room, okay? But if you have good memories of what happened on Sunday, I want you to share them. And, and we got three minutes, and then we'll come back and talk. <laughs> 